It's been two more weeks of development on Amy's World. The latest weekly build, which you can always try out in your browser on my itch.io page, has just a few visible improvements. First of all, I couldn't stand the static player symbol on the map any longer, so I did an animated version of Amy. There were some bumps learning how to do cutout animation in Godot, which I'll talk about later in this video. I also made proper screens for winning or losing the quest. Amy doesn't really die in the game, so she is carried home by an ambulance drone when she runs out of energy. These visual tweaks might not seem important at this stage, but I do think they help set the tone of the game and add a little personal flavor. So I attempt to steadily improve things like this, even when I am mostly working on other bigger parts of the game. It does help to have committed to do weekly updates on my itch.io page, I can't really get away with not doing anything visible on the game for a week. Also, even if nobody is really playing the game yet, it's still just one tutorial level, I do test each build before updating and always end up finding and fixing a few bugs that I hadn't noticed before. Should be good for quality in the long run. Most of my time though currently goes into fleshing out the procedural history and quest generation system. On the surface Amy's World is a card game, but the game is really about exploring the history of this world and there's a broad narrative arc of a collapsing old civilization and its technology. I am aiming at a mix of procedural and handcrafted narrative elements. The system I have in mind is loosely inspired by what the developers of Caves of Cut explained in this paper. There will be a few more layers to the system, adding cohesion and purpose to the narration. At least I hope so. It's all very experimental and very exciting, I just hope I'm not going to lose my remaining hair over this. As you can imagine, setting up such a system involves a lot of data wrangling. Fortunately, Godot comes with great support for stuff like text data files, JSON files, pattern matching, parsing and evaluating expressions. None of this is very complicated to use, but being new to it, I did get somewhat confused about data file handling in the current version 4.2 at first. So let's start the Godot tip section with that. Reading text files. You'd expect this to be really simple, and it is. There's a lot of outdated information floating around the internet though, so let me briefly recap here. You can add a text file to your project using the context menu in the file system view. Note that a text file is not a resource, so you can't load it with the load function. And also it's not automatically packed when you export the game. To read the file, use the file access class. For example, reading it line by line looks like this. To make sure the file gets packed with the exported project, add it to the exporter options here. Reading JSON files. JSON is a standard file format for common data structures such as dictionaries or arrays. You can add a JSON file to your project similar to a text file. But note the difference, JSON is a resource. This was a recent change which isn't yet reflected in the documentation. Make sure to change the suffix from TRES to JSON otherwise you won't be able to load the resource. Let's put in some content. You can now load this like any other resource using the load function. The data structures inside the resource are then accessed via the data property. And that's really it. Since JSON is now a resource, you also don't need to worry about adding the JSON file extension to the project exporter. Okay, now on to the cutout animation details I promised. To get to know the system, I was attempting to follow the Godot tutorial on cutout animation, but it's not working like that anymore. This page is outdated. After digging around a bit for more information, I have followed this approach. All the sprite parts are kept together at the top of the scene. The order of the sprites determines render order. So you can keep the far leg behind the front leg, for example. All the bones have to be children of a skeleton 2D instance. You set up the hierarchy by creating a tree of bone 2D children.
Next, add remote transform 2D nodes and link them to the sprites. The transforms of these nodes will be copied to the sprites. Setting up this indirection looks like useless additional work, but apart from keeping the render order separate from the skeleton definition, I like the flexibility. It's easy to swap out and reassign sprites without messing with the hierarchy. So after figuring all of this out, I went on to do this for my Amy character and created a truly terrible rig. I didn't even add knees out of laziness, which made walk cycle animation really hard. But I figure I'll have to redo animations anyway later on. After roughing in the keyframes, I was expecting to be able to adjust and smooth out animations in the curve editor, as one would do it in Blender. So I pressed this button a lot and wondered why it doesn't do anything. And the simple answer is that you have to explicitly create a BZ track to use the curve editor which is only available for single float values, not for, say, positions. Well, I got a halfway decent walk cycle done anyhow, and it's still a big improvement. And that's all for today. See you in the next update.